Let's go. You know it. I don't know if we'll always use this song, but we are today. I'm just sitting on your front porch Wondering how could I be so far from my home Happy holidays, guys. Happy early holidays. And my mind is somewhere else But when I find it, I'll patch up where it's been blown You little kicking pigeons, baby. You kicking pigeons. Now I'm just floating on the breeze And I feel I'm falling like these leaves I must be on a stone this that week baby braid your cousin's hair oh but when i reach that ground i'll share this piece of mind i found i can feel it in my bones tickle yourself man do but it i dare you a little time for me to set that parking brake and let myself all mine shine that light on me come on Tell you my stories. Shine on me. Find a song. Sing it. Yeah, for you. Thank you guys for being here. Happy Thanksgiving week. It is uh, November in the year of 2018. And you got, oh, I know you can hear it. And you know we got still we we all still got a little bit of work to do this week, but you can you can hear the wheels of of uh, of the busy year. You can hear those brakes starting to lock up, and you can hear them. You can hear the year starting to grind to a halt. And man, it is kind of nice. It is kind of, and, and if you're still going real hard, take a deep breath. You know, take a hit off the universe and bring it down. Do something relaxing, you know. You know, tickle somebody. Feel how soft, you know, like a senior citizen is or like a, you know, take your dog for a walk. Try to read a book. I mean, we're so scattered, or I'm so scattered these days, I can't barely read, but every now and then, you know, I try to read. And that's like the old reading a book, is just trying to read one. But do something, you know, hug somebody. It's Thanksgiving week. Dude, I thought of this, if you want to send in a, a, a clip of, it's called Relative Rodeo. And that's hashtag Relative Rodeo. And that's at Thanksgiving, you got to hug a relative that maybe don't really want a hug from you. And somebody else in your family have to film it. And you got to stay on for as long as you can. So it's a wild game. But in the end, you know, a lot of times it can bring people closer together. Uh, but that, if you want to send that in to me, hashtag relative rodeo, I'll be peeping some of those. Uh, but no, no fake ones, man. Don't send in, you know, I need eight. I, I want to, I want to see somebody going eight seconds. You know, I want to see somebody really hitting it hard out there. Dallas buyer clubbing. Don't come in, you know, with you cheating and it's just you and somebody you already are friends with, or, you know, we're doing sex with in your family or not, you know, a like I mean, a wife or a, you know, fiance or something. I want to see that real relative rodeo, but if you want to send that to me and make it a hashtag relative rodeo on social medias. What else, man? Oh, I, uh, yeah, I can just hear the year grinding to a halt and I can feel, I can feel some peace, man. I had a nice time. At, I just had a nice weekend just relaxing, really. I really did, you know, just kind of chilling out and, you know, I've been going through some things and you guys, you know, some of the listeners have been really supportive and sent some nice messages in and, and I'm grateful for that, you know, and I just realize, uh, I'm grateful to just be alive and still be able to learn even at this age and even at this point in my life to still be able to have the opportunity 
uh, to be alive in this playground um, and uh, be able to experience life and experience some of the things that are going on, whether they be highs or lows or, you know, just learning experiences. Um, you know, I've, I've been, I've met a lot of wonderful people so far in my life. Uh, and a lot of them are you guys. And thank you guys for uh, being a part of this, this past year. We're coming up on two years of this past weekend. It's so crazy. It's, you know, when I think about it, it's, uh, it's just, it's cool. It's cool. And we're, we're going to do some great things. I want to thank all the Patreon supporters, and I'm going to thank them by name at the end of the podcast. And I want to thank uh, all the listeners and everybody that's been coming out, um, helping us do some neat things. You know, the single moms. Um, you know, we're going to put out our game show episode of uh, Get That Cash, which is uh, hiding the hotel room money for the cleaning lady. And, and then, you know, I want to continue to cr- incorporate some other ideas and do other fun stuff. Uh, that makes me feel good, honestly. And, um, and and we do a lot of that together. And I'm grateful for you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Happy Thanksgiving uh, to you uh, from me. Uh, I love this time of year. You know, I remember at this time of year when I was young, you know, the carnival sometimes would come by, you know, when it was kind of cool enough. Maybe that was August or something, but in the fall, the carnival would come by, and they had, oh, I remember one time when I was a child, they had a, you know, somebody set the car, the Ferris wheel, and a Ferris wheel was like, it's basically like deja vu, but like on a big metal machine. So I don't know if you ever had deja vu, but it's like that. It's like somebody made a machine out of it. And you get on there, and usually the guy that's letting you on the Ferris wheel, he, you'll ask him a question about safety or how long you're going to be on or anything like that, and he won't, he can't hear you or has no answers or no information. I mean, sometimes, too, he'll be wearing, like, these big, you know, uh, earmuffs, these big Air Force earmuffs. And they're these earmuffs they made so when you're in the Air Force, you can pretend like you're not. And sometimes you'll see guys having them on airfields and stuff. And and so, basically, this guy who you're asking information for that's, that, that was operating the ride, he couldn't even fucking hear you. And then he would lock you in a cage, man. He would lock you in this kind of caged up deal and then he would start it off and just start you just spinning around through the same moment over and over again. And I remember one time they set the they set the um they set the one time they set the Ferris wheel up, the ride, up too close to a a tree, a oak tree or a you know, or like a haunted maple or something, you know, but it looked like an oak. And they had a wasp nest up there. And dude, I don't know if I remember a more harrowing experience, you know. Um, and this was me and my boy Robert, and he had this internal whisper going on where, you know, Robert would, you know, he was like, he, he I think I've talked about him before. He was like kind of supposed to be twins, but he never separated. And so he always, you would hear him say something and say it, it, you'd hear it echo again inside of him, you know? He'd be like, oh, I want a sandwich. I want a sandwich. He'd be like, uh, oh, man, I had too much gravy at dinner. I had too much gravy at dinner. You know, he, he would say something again under his breath. He had repetitive verbal syndrome or something. So anyway, dude, you get on this Ferris wheel and this bitch is just taking you over and over again through the wasps. Every kid on the thing screaming, crying, getting stung, people jumping off the fucking little, I remember fucking Daniel hit the air, bro, right off, just jump probably 90 feet off, just out and who knows into what, nobody, I don't even know what happened to him, but this man had set the dang Ferris wheel up under a wasp nest, and I mean, every time we went back there, it was just like us, just 
it was our Iwo Jima, man. It was just tr like trying the beaches of Normandy just over and over and again. You know, and just, just, oh, man. We was just out there done, Kirk, and just getting just torn our ass up every time. You know, you'd think you'd, and you'd go down, and then the next, the kids behind you were going in, just screaming, just getting wasped up. Oh, because of some jackass. And the guy you're screaming, he can't hear you. He had on those Super Air Force headsetters. And God, I remember that that was miserable. But I remember when we got off of it, and, you know, they had probably, probably maybe 16, 17 kids that had been wasped up. You know, one boy was just, he didn't know what the fuck was going on. Somebody, somebody was dripping, you know, dripping diesel under his tongue or something or putting kerosene in his mouth or something. You know, they're trying to, this was back when they didn't know how to solve a lot of, you know, uh, medical issues. But they gave everybody free cotton candy. And I remember going from such a low of like, damn. You know, here I am at the fair, one, the one thing around the area that I can afford every year. And I'm excited about, and now I'm walking around all stung, and and the cotton candy did help. I remember that. You know, I do remember that. But I, I just loved this time of year when the air was different and things were a little more still, and you could hear, uh, you know, there wasn't as many animals. Because where I grew up, they had a lot of animals, you know, crickets, um, you know, not vultures, but, you know, Angry birds, you know, like, uh, you know, you know, kind of ducks, but it had some violence in them. You know, sparrows, you'd have nightingales trying to, you know, land in people's afros and shit like that. And I remember it just, um, and at this time of year, a lot of the animals went to Barbados or, you know, down to the southern hemisphere. And so you got a little relaxation. You wouldn't hear all the animals you know, doing sex or just being around each other. You wouldn't hear a lot of that, you know, fighting or whatever, you know, procreating or anything. So you got more just stillness in the air. And I always love that about this time of year. But damn, I'll never forget that shit, man. That dude set that freaking Ferris wheel up onto that wasp nest. And every time we went through, man, whew, <laughs> Man, it was crazy. We went through some things, you know, and we went through some things together back then. And that was my buddy Robert, man, haunted Robert. And he seemed very haunted, you know, because I think he was supposed to be twins, but they never separated in the womb. And so we always had, you know, his little, you know, this little bad boy sibling inside of him lurking. You know, he was that double entendre, you know, that you know he was that confluence you know he was that uh you know he had a little bit of reverb going on inside of his dna and that was a special time though you know what actually reminded me of that recently i was in the airport and i was in minnesota airport and man i love minnesota airport people are nice they got them scratchers they got the um the scratch off lottery tickets because, you know, if you want to fucking take a chance, I like to be able to take a chance every now and then. And in the old days, you could do different stuff to take a chance. You know, you could uh, you could commit a crime back in the day. They didn't have a DNA or anything. They had a wanted poster. That was it. They had one dude's drawing of you. So all you had to know was, it, you know, how good the local artist was. And if they were shit, then you could do a crime. You could take a chance, you know, do a robbery or do a um a burglary or do something. But now taking a chance, you know, it's harder to take a chance. And that's why I like sometimes they have um scratch off ticket machines, them scratchers. And uh and they're domiciled up there in those, you know, in these little things in the airport. But anyway, so Oh, what reminded me of the th of the being on the Ferris wheel was somebody uh, let some of their booty out, you know, body gas out of their butt um, at the on the uh, electric floor escalator. Yes, 
at Minnesota Airport. And this was, I'll see what date it was in case anybody else was over there. This was um, November 4th. Probably, this was like about 8.30, 8 to 8.30 a.m. I don't know if anybody else caught this, you know, this cloud. But this, I mean, somebody unleashed their whole, I mean, it was almost like somebody had a ghost hiding in their butt, you know? And this thing just suddenly just haunted, started haunting the universe right there in the airport. And somebody did it on the on the moving floor, that moving escalator. So, man, you it just flashed back. Dude, you had, and I went down and got lost because I was going, I was supposed to be in D, and I went to E. So, next thing you know, I went through it twice. So, you know, they just had this big, you know, this big vulgar sort of, you know, this big vulgar sort of uh, metamorphosis air bubble out there that somebody had, you know, straight up launched out of them, out of their body just on this escalator. So people were just moving through it, just moving, just, mm, mm, mm. oh man. I bet, I don't know if somebody was just like a damn Dexter just sitting off to the side just watching that go down, but that was, but it reminded me of going up on that Ferris wheel and going through the wasps and just coming back around and going through the wasps, you know, because we were just, we had no, we couldn't, we couldn't stop, we couldn't stop it. We couldn't stop it. And that was, um. That was pretty powerful there, and that was in a Minnesota airport. But then I went through it once, and I was like, pff, I was angry. And, you know, I get angry in my head at people I don't know, and then, you know, I start kind of getting racial and everything, and just who knows. So I'm cursing out all these people in my head. And and uh, and then I realized that I went to the wrong terminal, so I went back through it. So at that point, I'm like, dude, you're an idiot. You know, you're just an, you know, you're just a dang, an air idiot anyway. You don't know what's in the air sometimes and you'll go through it twice. So definitely, you know, really an air idiot. But, but I do love this time of year and I just, you know, I remember the carnival growing up we would go to and Thanksgiving, like school was taking a break. Um, and I don't remember what we would do at Thanksgiving. I mean, I oh, we would see sometimes my grandparents a lot, and they would cook, or, you know, my mom would do some cooking, and it was really nice. You know, it was just a nice, I don't think we were a big Thanksgiving family, but it was just a nice time of year because we got to play football outdoors. And our street, man, I'll tell you one thing I loved about growing up on McGee Street in Covington, Louisiana, was that we played football and i'm wearing right now i got this barry sanders uh from roots of fight they gave me this sweet sweet little blue top and um and this thing feels good it's a sweatshirt and a sweatshirt is just a shirt that's trying to you know trying to get you to feel even more gentle and and we would play football man we would get out there i mean we played almost i bet we played 200 days a year after school, we'd go down to the church parking lot and church uh, field. They had a big field by the church near us, and we would get down there and play it. Man, it felt good. You know, it just felt, it, it was just fun. It was fun, man. It was one thing that we all in the area did together. And sometimes the big boys would come and just beat the, you know, they would play, but really their only goal was to beat us, just be physically beat everybody's ass. You know, the score would be nothing, nothing. We'd kick it off to them, and it would be first down for them, and then they would just beat everybody's ass. And that was it. That was the whole game. There was no real game. It was just, you know, kind of like self-defense. But, you know, there was like a football, you know, around us. Oh, but it was a fun time, man. Um, I had some sets this weekend at the Comedy Store. Uh, I saw Joe Rogan's. That was cool. I saw... We have some good guests coming up this week. Um, we have, uh, which ones were we taping? We have some episodes coming up. Or we have some episodes coming up. Ronald White, you know, one of um, my mother's favorite comedian. Ronald White, um, or Ron White, Donnell Rowlings, a beautiful black gentleman, 
You know, I feel like he and I have, uh, we have some great uh, conversations. I'm really looking forward to that. He's one of my favorites. And Jim Jefferies. And Jim Jefferies is an Australian who's here on work visa. And, uh, and he may be taking advantage of the system. Who knows? But we'll see. But um, I'm very excited, man. Three, uh, you know, three men that I certainly admire and look up to um, in their comedic abilities and prowess. Uh, what else? Yeah, I got some nice calls, man. I was having a tough time last week, and I'm still going through some stuff, you know, on a personal level. Um, you know, I'm just thankful, I guess, that I'm still able to grow. You know, that I'm still... I was trying to, you know, I really want to focus this week on being thankful and just and just getting outside of myself. You know, one thing that makes me sick sometimes, I, I get sick of myself. I don't know if that, I, I think it's just this era and this time where, the, you know, this me generation type of thing. Um, and it's not even a generation, it's a me culture. You know, I noticed the other day when I was, uh, and I've noticed this enough times where now it's become like a hypothesis, I guess, but or a theory. But when you get out, when an elevator opens now, the people who are, are automatically try to get in first now. You notice that? And it used to be nothing like that. It used to be the elevator open. You waited to see who was there. They were coming out. But now that's not the case. The se- if you're in the elevator, the second it hits the floor, the door's open. Whoever's there is already getting in. And I know that sounds like, well, that is, that's nothing, Theo. That's nothing. But to me, that seems like, you know, like more like we're just so much in our own heads that we don't even think that somebody else could be in the box. You know, we don't think about that. And it's and and that that's almost and I've and I could be crazy, but I think I've noticed that enough. Where I'm like, oh, this is a real thing, and I even notice myself do it sometimes. Like, oh, I'm trying to go in. These doors aren't even really open yet, and these people still have to come out of the elevator. And so that's when I start to think, oh, well, if I'm noticing it and I'm doing it, it's just something that's starting to occur in the world. And then I start to think, well, why is this starting to occur? And I think it's just because we're all thinking just that we're on our own paths as opposed to we're on a group path. So this, this week I want to hit some more, you know, you, you know, I go to a meetings and stuff like that and some uh, 12 step and just stuff to, I don't want to, I'm just tired of thinking about myself. Don't, does anybody else feel that I'm just kind of sick of myself? Like not in a bad way, but just, It's just like, man, haven't we had enough of ourselves? It's like we just, every moment there's news and information and humanity, 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 but, but so trivialized because it's so redundant that it's, you know, I just, I just, I don't know. I want something that, I, I don't know. It's just like I could just use a little bit, and I mean this in a positive way. This isn't like a, you know, some kind of plea for help. I just, I'm tired of thinking about my, I'm tired of this, you know, our brains are, you know, the software isn't, I don't think, it doesn't super fit well with some of the times. And I think my software is just tired of running, you know, so I just need to, you know, I'm excited to just kind of go to some meetings that gets me out of my head and makes me think about others. And when I can... When I can hear somebody else's story and sh- hear them share pieces of their lives and things that mean something to them, um, that's when I feel that, you know, I really feel warmed up by the world and I feel more hopeful. So that's something. Today's episode is brought to you by Ridge Wallet. Everybody, you know, I saw a man yesterday, he had a Ridge Wallet and right out the gate, I had to hug him, you know, now I only hugged him for maybe a second or two, but that's still a hug. And that's the beauty of Ridge Wallet. It brings things together, like things you used to keep in your back pocket. Suddenly those things are up in the front. Oh, where's all your stuff? I know, right in your fucking pocket, dude. Where it should be. Ridge Wallet keeps the things you need. No more, you know, sometimes someone will have a wallet with something like a damn butterscotch or something in it. Get the fuck out of here, Henry. That's fucked up. Regular stuff. Regular wallet. Ridge, that front pocket carry. 
Visit ridgewallet.com slash Theo and use code Theo at checkout for 10%. That's ridgewallet.com slash Theo and use code Theo for 10% off. Ridge Wallet, that front pocket carry. What else? Oh, dude, I remember when I was a child, they had this dude, Mr. Lance, that lived by us, and he had this monkey, right? And one time it was Thanksgiving, I think, or Christmas break, but I think it was Thanksgiving because I don't remember, you know, when I think about the memory, I don't, you know, think about, like, I don't hear a lot of jingle bells in the background of the memory. And Mr. Lance had this monkey, and, you know, it was a regular monkey. Some people thought it was a like a, a – some people at first for a little while thought it was a child in a little suit, a little costume. But I, it was a monkey, and I saw – I eventually saw it, and it was definitely a monkey, right? Well, dude, we go over there. Some of the older boys I remember at Thanksgiving, we went over there, and – and for, you know, I don't know how much they gave him, but, you know, a couple dollars, the monkey, if you got up close by the cage, the monkey would pull your hair, right? And while it was pulling, it would, uh, you know, it would, uh, you know, do, the, do some masturbation, you know, spray out. Um, and, you know, I, I believe that we maybe evolved from monkeys that God created, right? That's where my kind of beliefs are. You know, I'm kind of in that middle ground. Um, you know, I think we're definitely there's. I think there's something more special about us than just being part of Kingdom Animalia. But when you see a monkey masturbate, that's when I was like, "Oh, there's no way that we're like them," because they do it. I mean, this this little guy was like the damn Riddick bow of jerking off. You know, this was. You know, Sugar Ray, uh, this was Sugar Ray Leonard's of, of jerking off. This little thing, you know, this monkey, I, I mean, he was using both hands. He was using the back of his hands, front of his hands. He was, at one point, he took his own dick off and just juggled it in the air until it came, until it sprayed out. And I'm like, gee, purse, you know, we can't do that. So that's when really some of the stuff for me kind of started to separate, I guess, when you look at that sort of deal. But but I remember, man, a couple bucks, we'd go over there and the older boys would get this thing. They would hold, uh, they would hold, the monkey would hold, reach out the cage and hold their hair, it would pull their hair real tight. And something about that created sexuality in the monkey. You know, and the second he started pulling their hair, he would get real fired up and he would you know, go over and exacerbate himself or whatever, you know, do himself out with his hand, you know, make part of his body just in a little bit of, uh, you know, water, like kind of thick water come out of the front of him. And it was, it was fucking wild, I guess, man. I don't know. It was mother nature. This is before they had the nature channel. So this is back when, if you saw something exciting like that, you just kind of treasured it and you know, it was, that was our nature channel, I guess. Now they got the nature channel. You can watch anything you want on the internet. You know, you can, you can watch four bison in a dang, uh, you know, doing 69s or whatever. You know, you could watch two animals kind of kissing or, you know, you could watch a hippopotamus fucking, you know, caressing a dove's wing if you want. I mean, there's all, uh, there's everything. But when we had it, you had to go see the nature. You had to go see the nature and you had to see the nature up front. And those are some things that I miss about being young and, and just this time of year, man. And Mr. Lance, I don't know how that dude had a monkey. But back then, every couple people had a monkey. You know, it was, now it's like some fucking loser next to you on Twitter. I swear it's 5,000 people on Twitter ruining the fucking world. That's what I think it is. People crying about this and complaining about this. I mean, man, some of this shit has just gone too much. You know, and I do think that some of that kind of like more relaxed culture is going to start to come back into us. And we're going to, you know, hopefully start to chill out a little. 
but Mr. Lance had that monkey, man, and it was, you know, and the cage was kind of gold. It was like a gold cage. It wasn't real gold. But when you're a kid, you think it's real gold. So you think, oh, man, you know, Mr. Lance got that real special primate. He has a special creature here. And so then that's why the older boys, they had a little bit of money. I didn't have any money. So I had to watch their, you know, their ride. You know, I had to watch their, you know, you see a monkey grab a boy's hair and start jerking off. Man, it makes you think about evolution. You know, and so I guess there was some real positives with that. But that was something that happened at Thanksgiving. What else? Oh, my mother would always get mad because she would give us a little cut of that jelly cranberry. You know, some people get the cranberry. It's got real cranberries in it. And you can tell a family's, uh, you could tell a family how real they are. You know, you could tell how many gang signs a family uses by what style of cranberry they got at Thanksgiving's. Because where I'm from, we had that jelly deal. You know, we had that little, look like a little batch of science had made it. You know, and fuck one year, my mom just put a damn thing, of Concord grape out there. She put it in the freezer for about an hour and a half and then set that shit on the table. And we all had just, you know, fucking grape jam, you know, and just lied to ourselves. But usually with the cranberry, you know, when we had it, we, when we got the real cranberry jelly, we, my mother would cut us off a slice of that and we get that, you know. If you were lucky, you got maybe about an inch and a quarter thick of that, of that jellied, you know, of that jellied wonderland, that cranberry. And then, but then as kids, we start, you know, we would all draw little dicks in it or do little, you know, uh, religious crosses or something or, you know, uh, Mickey Mouse ears, you know, fun shapes. But, and then they had wealthier people, you went to their house and they had... It was more like a, um, it was like the jelly, but it had real cranberries in there. It had real cranberries from, you know, from God or vegetables or whatever in the jelly. So it was like this double thing and it tasted like more like, it tasted not as like good. It kind of bothered you a little bit when you tasted it. It tasted kind of good and kind of like bothersome, you know, and like kind of like head lice, you know, kind of fun, but kind of fucking also, you know, not as fun. And then they had even richer people would just have a bowl of real cranberries right there. And I don't know if you ever had real cranberries, but they're disgusting. They taste like, um, they taste like you're just so rich that you don't even, you know, that you don't even, you would sacrifice good, good taste for just uh, looks. That's what it tastes like. So when you see real rich people, they just have a bowl of cranberries right there. And they'll put damn cinnamon on them or something or, you know, olive oil or something or some bullshit, you know, snake, uh, you know, snake, um, you know, snake dust or something, some fucking fancy accoutrement powder or whatever they'll put on top of it. And then you eat that and you're like, damn, man, I miss being fucking poor. Because this stuff tastes like shit. But, but yeah, you could tell a lot by a fan, you know, where a family is and how many gang signs they use and who they are as people by, you know, that cranberry, that sauce chart. And that's something special you can think about this holidays. Um, oh, what else, man? Ah. Uh, I'm going to do some shows this week. Oh, I have some shows to announce. I'll announce a couple right now. Um, and they are, I'm not announcing everything yet, but I got a bunch of new tour dates for the new year. Um, they are uh, Omaha, and that's January 11th and 12th at the Omaha Funny Bone, and then Irvine Improv, that's January 18th, 19th, and 20th. Uh, but yeah, I want to say, you know, I, I guess I just, I want to say thank you. You know, I want to say thank you guys for your support. Um, 
you know, even just this week, man, I got a lot of nice calls. You know, one of the guys who helped with the, who helped with the single mom thing in Salt Lake City last week, uh, heard the podcast and he's like, yeah, he, he gave me a call and said, you know, it seemed like I was having kind of a tough time and, um, and I think I have been, man, in some ways, you know, I'm not trying to get like emo or nothing, but you know, this year has just been kind of wild for me, you know, and it's been a lot of changes and I'm not like crying about the fact, like I'm grateful for the fact that, you know, I'm getting more opportunities with work and stuff like that, you know, um, but I think part of me, you know, I just feel, you know, like I just want to be better on the inside, you know, like sometimes I just don't feel always okay, you know. And it's, you know, when that's where I want to be, you know, that's where I want to feel good at, you know, it was inside of my heart and, and, uh, you know, I don't know if it's just part of the times we're in or maybe it's just me, but sometimes, you know, I, I just wonder if we're all not like missing like some crucial piece, some element that we're not seeing sometimes that there's something bigger out there. Um, as far as how we can feel more joy. And that could be like just a regional thing. It could be like an American thing. You know, I know certainly in my, in my area in Los Angeles, um, there lacks a lot of that. You, you know, it's just such a busy place. It's more of an office than it is uh, more of a, um, more of like an emotionally kind of connected place. You know, it's really... It's very trying, you know, and I'm grateful to be out here and to be battling that. So I have to recognize sometimes that, you know, I'm living in a place that doesn't cater to, uh, you know, to emotional well-being as much as it's much more emotionally efficient out here. Uh, but I appreciate it, man. I just got a lot of nice calls and stuff like that. And man, you guys, um, you know, it's nice. It makes me feel good, you know, because sometimes I don't feel OK. You know, and sometimes I want to be, you know, I don't know. Sometimes I just, you know, I just want to, I don't know, I just want to be okay, you know, and I just want to live a life that, you know, makes me feel uh, worthwhile. Um, and some of the moments that I've had that have made me most feel that way, honestly, have been through this podcast. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but, you know, just the calls that come in and, uh, you know, in the little things we do sometimes, like the calls, you know what gets me, man, the calls that come back in, you know, somebody will call in there, have an issue or something, you know, they got a, you know, they got bit by an animal or, you know, they lost their job or something, or, you know, a family member in a hospital or something, or, you know, funeral mix up type of deal or food poisoning or something. And then all the calls that will come in after it in response for like, you know, to kind of be supportive of that. It's just, uh, it's captivating sometimes. So, yeah, and sometimes I think, uh, you know, I just want to do like, I don't know. But I, I guess I just want to say thank you. So thank you guys for all your support this year. Um, and thank you guys for coming out to the show. Man, we got so many, there's going to be so many tour dates coming up in the new year. Uh, a lot of neat stuff going on. And a lot of neat stuff that that I'm going to do, and that we're pro that we're going to do as a group, and uh, and th just thank you very much, man, and happy Thanksgiving to you and yours. And you can, uh, you know, you can always send in that that uh, hashtag that video, and that is relative rodeo, and that's where you hug a relative that don't doesn't really prefer your arms around them, and see if you could stay on for eight seconds because that could be pretty wild. Uh, we had Eddie Bravo on the most recent episode. People love him. And you know what? I, you know what? I was watching that episode and it made me realize how much I miss Eddie. And uh, just when I don't get to see him. You know, one thing that was nice this weekend, I got to see Brian Callens up there. And him and, him and um, uh, Big Brown, Brandon Showers have a show called Fighter and the Kids or something. or some. I think it's called Somebody Beat Their Children. I'm not sure what it's called. But they have a great show, and, uh, and and it was nice to just see to see him out and about having fun. He's taping a new show called The Goldbergs, and you know I could just feel from some of his energy just how like you know hopeful and excited he is, and um, 
And man, Brian Callens is just a great person, man. He's really unique and interesting guy. He's so smart. And, you know, I love like, you know, I'm fortunate to work in this business that we're in sometimes, but, but, you know, like having a podcast and having people that show up and be part of this community has helped me realize that like, I don't need Hollywood to like validate me. You know, it's like I can create it and be part of a community where we validate each other. Um, and and that's one thing that I see, you know, some guys out here, you know, and they have opportunities and stuff like that. It's like I want to see I just hope that, you know, L.A. sometimes is a place where we don't realize our own values. You know, we don't see them because we're our eyes are set on this kind of prize a little bit. And uh, and I fall into that too. All of us do, and it's not a something we do that's wrong. It's just something that kind of happens out here. Uh, but anyway, I don't know what I'm talking about. But I'm just trying to think about just being grateful. You know, there's so many little things I think about that are great. You know, even that I could just even hold an orange. You know, imagine just looking at an orange but not being able to hold it. Or the fact you get to, you know, hug a cousin, you know? Dude, a cousin? I mean, let's be honest, dude. You could fucking probably kill a cousin and that's, you know, that's bad. But it's it's almost like practice for having a brother or sister. You know, you maybe you give your cousin a little bit of, you know, you make a little bit of turpentine wine and your cousin has the first couple sips. And next thing you know, y'all doing funeral services for him. But you know that now you know not to give that to your brother or sister or your siblings. Because a cousin is almost like a practice, like a get out of jail free family member. You could fucking, you could try out fireworks on your cousin or put him in a, you know, a, a neck brace that's a little too, has too much inches on it. So it makes his neck real soft, you know, it makes his neck not capable. But a cousin really is that. And this is, I don't know, there's just a lot of, uh, you know, it's that time of year. Where you can do, you know, just things to be thankful for. That we could breathe, you know, that we could taste jello. I mean, that we could, you know, that we could look somebody in the eyes and let them know how we feel. That's really powerful. That we can feel sorry, you know. Uh, you know, sometimes I feel sorry, you know, for stuff. You know, or that we can feel amazed. Sometimes I feel amazed. Um, you know, for the first time in my life recently, I've been able to realize like how much people love me, I think. Not like on a big scale, but even just small scale, like family members and friends and stuff like that. I've been able to like feel their, feel their, their, their care and affection more than I could in the past. And so, man, that's powerful. You know, it's powerful to be able to feel that. That's really a gift. To have the ability to feel somebody else's affections and emotions. Um, you know, to love somebody else. You know, and to learn about love, man. I had, uh, I had a moment this weekend where, I, you know, I gave my mother a call. And, um, you know, and I, and I love my mother, man. And, I, you know, I love my mother so much. And I always, you know... Uh, my mother's always been a great provider. You know, she tried as hard as she could, always made sure we had the birthdays and the, you know, and the little, you know, I had a um, Big Bird sweatshirt, you know, something else. What else? Um, I had a poster, Ric Flair, you know, a poster, uh, Candy Crawford. Um, of, you know, we had Tecmo Bowl. So, you know, she made sure that we had enough. You know, we had... Christmas, holidays, Easter. You know, she did all the things that you're supposed to do. She just struggled in being able to create like, a, you know, a loving, uh, an environment where I felt, you know, loved. I didn't feel unprovided. You know, we had, we had, we had just enough, you know. Um, but I just never, I think I never felt like loved as a child, you know. And this week I was able to have, you know, I had this conversation with my mom and it was just crazy, you know. And, and she knows that, you know, and she feels kind of bad. She feels bad about it. I think she just never learned it. She never learned this whole other world, this emotional world. She just learned more, you know, what you're supposed to do, like checking a list. Um, and I'm not, 
and, and it's nothing wrong. It's just a world that my mother didn't know about, you know. But, she, you know, she said that she, you know, she said we had a conversation and she was talking and she's like, you know, I really, I, you know, I apologize if I wasn't able to be there for you in these ways. And and then I felt bad. I apologize because I realized I, I couldn't be there for her. You know, I realized that the saddest thing for me was since my mother didn't, you know, since I couldn't feel my mother's love, there wasn't that bridge between us that I couldn't show her. Since there wasn't that bridge, I couldn't return and show her how much I loved her either. Because that's a two-way, you know, that bridge is the, it's the only thoroughfare there. And if your mother, you know, if you can't, if, you know, if my mom would have been emotionally showing me, you know, you know, nurturing me and cultivating me emotionally, then I, in turn, there wasn't that pathway for me to do the same for her. And I think I realized that I just want, I really wanted to be like a very loving child. You know, I wanted to be so much, I wanted to be... You know, I always thought I was like a daddy's boy, but I think I was like a straight up mama's boy. You know, don't tell anybody either. Please don't say anything. But but I didn't get that opportunity because we didn't have that connection, you know. So anyway, it was just a, you know, it was just like a, it was just a wild conversation. And I never, you know, I never would have had that. Like I was feeling kind of a little bit alone this week and my mom asked me about it. And she doesn't usually ask me about that kind of stuff. And uh, and it was the first time there was just like kind of like a moment where I was able to like kind of tell her, you know, that I felt alone, that 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 that, that that's how I felt. And then it kind of just took us into this other conversation, you know. Um, you know, I think where I just kind of always felt that way when I was young. Before I even had the ability to know that I was feeling that way, I just... You know, I felt that way on the inside. Even if on the outside everything was, you know, I was busy and had stuff to do. And I think I just felt that way. You know, I just felt like a, um, I just felt like a, a discomfort. Or just no feelings, you know, or something. You know, just a dis, just a just a discomfort, a dis ease, if you will. But anyhow, I didn't mean to get all emo into this shit. But this is the time of year where you're able to let people know you love them. This is the time of year where you're able to, you know, buy somebody a little something, get them a little, you know, a jug of milk or some, you know, suspenders for the baby or something. Do something special for somebody. Touch your fucking buddy, you know? Your buddy's gay, fucking kiss him, bro. Who gives a fuck? You know what I'm saying? It ain't all about you. You're not in the dudes. Fucking don't, you don't have to be in the dudes to fucking, you know, give your buddy $4, let him pull your hair and jerk off in the corner. You know what I'm saying? This is Mr. Lance's happy time. You know what I'm saying? Do what you got to do. But so let's say, you know, I'm going to try to this week just not make things about myself and get out there and, uh, and, and just, you know, not think about me, man, you know, uh, but it is a special time where if you have some, you know, if you have things you want to talk about with the relatives and stuff, you're together and you can bring those things up. And another amazing thing that can happen is forgiving people, man. Dude, forgiveness is the most powerful tool in the world. Dude, if they had a I, look, you, you can take AK-47s off the street. Don't take forgiveness off the street. Forgiveness, my God, man, that's the, that's dang Jesus Christ pickaxe right there. It's a beautiful tool. Um, let's take two calls, man. We had two calls today. I know it's an easy week, so I'm not going to bog you guys down with a big episode. Uh, let's see uh, what we got here. Okay. Uh, hey, Theo. 
how you doing? This is Kylie. I'm calling from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Hey, Kylie in Canada. Thank you for calling. And you guys, it's Thanksgiving. I know this. I was um, uh, communicating with a buddy of mine the other day, and he told me that it is. it was uh, about a month ago. Onward. You were talking to Chris from Long Island, and you were talking about um, underappreciating yourself and experiencing self-doubt. So this thing, and I just learned about this yesterday, and it's a psychological condition called imposter syndrome. And I know I experience it sometimes, and I feel like you might be experiencing a little bit, so I just wanted to share that information with you. And what it is is you start to doubt your own accomplishments. You experience a lot of self-doubt, and you start to think once you're experiencing success that you don't deserve to be there. I feel like you might be experiencing a bit of that, and I just want you to know that you're not alone in that. And I think that it's important to just keep pushing onward, onward, and knowing that you know, you're not your past and you might come from this underdog perspective and you might come from this place of humble beginnings and that will always be a part of you, but it, you don't have to think that if you don't remain that person, you don't deserve success and you don't deserve um, what's coming to you. Yeah, check it out. Read more about it. Imposter syndrome. I love you, Theo. Thanks for listening. If you ever want to talk to a contemporary dancer, well, let's, let's chat. You know what I mean? Well, you just did the samba through my heart right there. Um, that's sweet of you. I appreciate the, uh, the nice words. And I'm looking this up as you were talking about it. Imposter syndrome. Um, also known as imposter phenomenon, imposterism, fraud syndrome, is a psychological pattern in which an individual doubts their accomplishments and has a persistent internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud. Wow. That's interesting. And this is just wiki. This is just Wikipedia. Uh, 10 ways to overcome imposter syndrome. Break the silence. Separate feelings from fact. Um, accentuate the positive. Visualize success. Those are a couple of them. But that's interesting. You know, it is funny. I guess somehow... I, yeah, I think there is. When it, it's funny when you get to the world when I feel like fear of being exposed as a fraud. It's like, yeah, may, yeah, I feel like that. Like, yeah, like maybe somewhere, like in my in my brain, you know, I just there's this thing that says, "Oh, you're not, you're not good. No matter what you're doing, you're not good, or you're not." I don't know. Imposter syndrome. I'll look more into it, and I appreciate you sharing that. It's sweet of you. And, um, you know, it's funny. I was talking to Brian Callens last night at the uh, at the comedy store, the world-famous comedy store on Sunset Boulevard. And he was saying, man, something. sometimes the things about comedians is that we are just fucked up. You know, and I'm not saying this is like a woe is me, but that, but that there's something askew. You know, just like as with an athlete, he have... You know, he has um, multiple, you know, abilities, super abilities. And so that makes them a good athlete. He's like, with a comedian, you have, you know, multiple deficiencies. <laughs> and so that makes you something wrong with you. Um, but like in a good way, like if you weren't, if you didn't have whatever it was, then you, you wouldn't be how you are. You know, you wouldn't. You know, uh, and I'll say it is funny, as he was saying that, I was thinking, man, it's like the things I used to be most ashamed of, like, you know, some of the environment that I was in and are the, some of the things that are making me ha are, are, are fueling some of the stories that I'm able to tell today on stage that is bringing joy to people. And so I guess that is a good point. But he said sometimes just don't fight it and just embrace it. And I think some of that is some of the stuff I want to do in this, you know, in this coming year is just be more active in trying to get myself uh, not better, but just, yeah, just moving forward, you know, like instead of like dwelling in kind of some of this stuff sometimes, just get past it and go on and try experiences that can help me get to other levels of, of comfort and wellness and personal, you know, goodness. Um, let's take one more call that came in, man. Both of these were pretty nice. Our producer, Nick said, I'm thankful to our producer, Nick, uh, for all he's done this year in helping this podcast be a part of something, um, stay busy with, uh, you know, a lot of good things. 
Uh, Chris Hansen might be coming on. So could you even imagine Chris freaking Hansen? How how relaxing is it to meet meet Chris Hansen, but not how a lot of other dudes have met him? So, and that's the man from Dateline where they're trapping dudes with the uh, Gatorade and stuff with the Gatorade, um, the children's Gatorade. All right, let's take this other call. ¿Qué pasó, tío? So, Gerardo Flores from Amarillo, Texas, carnal. Hey. Oh, hola, 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 Carlos. Um, gracias. Brother, um, man, I was just scrolling through my Instagram feed and uh, I come across one of your story feeds and it showed uh, when you were picking up your nieces. Man, just seeing their reaction. Oh, yeah, I would pick them up for school, uh, Halloween, man. Onward. Reactions, their facial expressions when they realize it's you picking them up, dude, and it's just love and joy. It, uh, it put things in perspective for me, and uh, I just want to say thank you, bro, for everything you do. It made me realize uh, I got to share the most moments in my life with my loved ones. And uh, I hope you, I know you do, for a fact. Uh, just the, uh, I guess this cause just more of a little reminder for you. Uh, you put that kind of stuff out into the world, just sharing those, 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 that side of your life to us, man, and it, it, it puts things in perspective to us as well, man, so... I uh, love you. Keep doing what you do, bro. Love you too, man. That's nice of you to share. Yeah. You know, it's funny to see. Um, yeah, I appreciate you saying that, man. You know, it, uh, it's nice. It makes me feel good. You know, it makes me feel good. It makes me feel, you know, it makes me feel like, I guess, embarrassed a little bit, too. I don't know. Like, there's part of me, and I don't know if this is just humanity or so, our society that does this that makes us feel like, like a shame to, like, show. No, this isn't society. This is just me. I think, like, a lot of my life I was, like, ashamed to show my family um, and have my family, like, be a part of, like, my my life in some ways. I think I was just angry growing up. I was angry. You know, that my father was so old, I was angry that we were poor. You know, I was angry that, you know, the other people's moms seemed to, you know, be able to, like, love their children differently. And, you know, I was just ashamed, I guess, of, like, who I was. So I didn't, you know, I think my whole life I just went, I tried to get away from, I just tried to get to a place where I just felt okay. You know, and I feel bad about some of those things, but nobody told me when I was a kid, you know, not to be ashamed of where I'm from, you know, or not to be ashamed of who I am. Nobody told me any of that, so I didn't know. You know, I just knew, and some of it was, you know, to take care of myself and all that. Anyway, this episode got, has gotten kind of emo, but I appreciate you saying that, man. It does make me feel good these days to be able to, you know, to be an uncle and to go around children and not be a pedophile. You know, or pedo, um, pediophile. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel good to know I could pick a couple kids up in a truck and I know the kids. I mean, that's a solid fucking feeling to have these days. And I'm just grateful that, you know, a higher power has kept me on enough of a path to see some of these joys. Because, man, I remember when my sister had a child, I was so angry at her. I didn't know my sister, I didn't really know her. You know, the only thing I knew was that I just had an, I had an opportunity to be angry at her. And since we'd fought so much as kids, the only way I knew to even connect with her was to through, through to be angry. And then she, you know, she had a baby and then it changed everything. You know, it was just something that you could like love so much, you know, a little kid. And it just, you know, and it just reflected that love so accurately that I could just... You know, I could never be mad at my, I mean, I could be mad at my sister, but I could never, it was different now. And that's one of the things that I think is going to solve uh, a lot of racial issues that they have in the world. A lot of racism and stuff will be solved over time by uh, joint births, you know, mixed, or people call them mixed babies where I'm from, but now it's called something else, I don't know. But like, yeah, if a black family and a white family they their their children have a child together, then they both are gonna love that child. And when you love something together, when you both love the same thing, 
And that's really where a lot of possibility starts for things to, uh, for you to forget the, the differences. So I think long term that you'll see a lot of that in the world. And I think that that's just the way it's supposed to happen anyway. And we're still coming out of colonial times where people fucking lost. Some people lost their whole civilizations. The Mayans, fuck them, bro. They made a shitty calendar and they showed up two, they showed up two days early to get in their ass beat and they got beat. You know, um, uh, who else? Brit, the Britons f- fucked everybody, man. They enslaved half of the world. They, they eliminated so many cultures, a lot of people lost. You know, Native Americans, they got popped off when, uh, when Americans left from Britain. They got popped off. Slave Africa, slaves got jacked out by, you know, the French or the Spanish, whoever it was. I think Leandro Cortez or something, his boys down there, you know, doing the bait and switch on a lot of brothers and selling them into work. You know, it's like something just happened. But I think over time and as the world become more of a melting pot, you know, beige power, that's what I always say, beige power. You know, I feel like it's the direction we're headed in. Um, and ultimately it's, it's a solution, I think, to some things, you know, I think when we can all like, cause it is, it really is seeing the same thing and loving something that's similar that does bring, really bring people together. You know, I mean, as much as I want to fucking, you know, be Tony Montoya and sh- you know, shoot up the universe and get all coked out. I don't know if that's always the best solution, you know? Um, but anyway, I don't know how this, I don't know how any of this gets into anything, but we'll take some calls in the last week, you know, going into last week to responses to things and stuff. But I just wanted to say a thank you to everybody. You know, I want to say thank you for making, um, you know, this podcast has changed a lot of my, you know, just a lot of my, I don't know. It's just changed, uh, you know, it's made me feel. It's like the one thing that's been consistent every week. You know, I mean, there's been a couple of other, you know, a couple people and, but, uh, you know, and sometimes sometimes I've chosen this podcast over, over everything in a lot of ways, you know, over just having this opportunity and having this space. And so I just want to say thank, thank you to the, the listeners for, you know, sharing things that are going on in your lives. You know, I get, I get a lot of messages that just say, Hey, Theo, thank you. You know, I'm five months sober. I am, you know, I am, uh, you know, I heard something in your podcast that made me think or made me feel. And, and I, you know, that, I think that means a lot to me, man, because uh, all I really, I think I, when I was young, I wanted so much to have somebody around my life that made me feel something that wasn't, you know, sad because I just always felt sad. Or ashamed, you know? And it's almost scary sometimes to have something to be proud of. Um, you know, it's such kind of, it's such rare, ter- it's such unchartered kind of territory for me to really take pride in something and not just like let my ego be proud of something, but to actually really feel like pride on the inside. Uh that's why I think it really just takes a while to set into my skin because I'm just really not used to it. But I'm grateful to have the opportunity, grateful for my producers, um, you know, premature Nick, Nick at night. He's actually, you know, he says he went full term. Who knows? We'll have him as a guest, I think, sometime so we can learn more about him. Uh, Chris Perez, you know, mi hermano, um, who, you know, helped this podcast scoot off you know, really uh, put in his two cents. I, he doesn't communicate. I haven't heard from him recently, but, you know, there were countless nights and times when he was there to help out. Um, and then just all these guys around me, you know, these other podcasters that include me in their world and they make me feel a part of their community, you know. And, uh, man, it's just this podcast community is kind of giving me like a brotherhood or like a team that I've never really kind of had in some ways. And it's just, man, it's great. You know, enough about me. But thank you to you. I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. 
you know, I want to see those videos. If you can do that relative rodeo, hashtag relative rodeo, hug somebody in your family that maybe don't want that hug. See if you can stay on for eight seconds, you know, and that's beautiful. And I want to say thank you, too, to uh, my Patreon uh, supporters. And these are people uh, who support on Patreon, and that's the money that goes towards um, getting camera people to help with uh, the single moms and doing the um, doing the the new game show stuff that we're doing too. So, uh, so I'm going to rattle those off. Uh, thank you guys. Be good to yourselves. Happy Thanksgiving. We have Donnell Rawlings on our Thanksgiving episode. So. Finally, we got a real, I'm talking a, a loped out brother. This dude has tats on his straight up dick, you feel me? We got a real uh, hermano negro in here, you know? Um, and I'm not saying that, in I'm saying that in Spanish. So filter that through Espanol before you come at me. Um, but we got a real, uh, a real guy that I love talking to about all types of stuff. So I'm really looking forward to being able to get into some conversations with him but um all right let's take us out with a little bishop gun and then we'll uh we'll rattle off aaron jones aaron stein addison ardolino adriana hernandez aiden duffy alaskan rock vodka and dude if you're in alaska bro you better be rocking vodka alex hitchens alex person alex sideris alexander contreras amanda sherman andrea gagliani andrew valish Andy Mack, Angelo Reagan, Angie Angelis, Anna Winter, Anthony Schultz, Ariel Nicole, Ashley Kanicki, Audrey Harlan, Austin Keller, Ben, Ben Dignan, Ben Limes. Ooh, damn, boy. You probably got a drinking problem. Uh, Benjamin Strait, Street, Big Easy, Brian Reinhold, Bubba Hodge, California Outlaw, Calvin Doyle. Campbell Heil, Carla Huffman, hey Carla, uh, Casey Roberts, uh, Casey Rudsell, Chad Saltsy, I'll see you in uh, Lexington, Christian from Bakersfield, Christopher Stath, Clint Lyle, Cody Cummins, Cody Kenyon, Cody Marsh, Dan Draper, Dan Ray, David Smith, David Wyrick, Donald Blackwell, Dweji Majd, Dweji Majd, Majd, Felicity Black, Felix Wren, Gabrielle Almeida, Garrett Blankenship, Ginger Levesque, Greg H., Gunt Squad Gary, Garcia, Jacob Ortega, Jacob Rice, Jacob Rice sound like a damn dish, James Ashmore, James Banks, James Bound, oh, so close, Jameson Flood, the musician, James Bragg, Jason Haley, Jeffrey Lucero, also has sent in some beautiful music, Jenna Sunday, Jer Jerry Zhang, Jerry Zhang, bro, that Hebrew, uh, maybe Chinese mix, beautiful, Jesse Witham, thank you, Jesse, Joe Dunn, Joey Desroyers, Joey Piemonte, John Ketch, John Ross, Josh Cowger. Justin L., Justin Marcoux, Justin Shuey, Karen Sullivan, Caddy Doyle, Kennedy, Kenton Call, Kevin Best. Ooh, I wonder if that's Kennedy that was on MTV. That's on uh, Fox and Friends now. Kevin Fleury, Kevin Best, my t-shirt man. Kiera Parr, Kirk Cahill, Kish, Kishaline, Kristen Rogers, Lacey Breesmeister, Laura Williams, Lauren Cribb, Leighton Fields, uh, Logan Yakman. Luke Danton, Mark Bentley, Matt Holland, Matt Kamen, Matt Lefwich, Matt Azam, Matthew Price, Matthew Sizemore, Matthew Snow, uh-oh, eight ball daddy, Megan Daly, Megan Lacasse, Michael Polcaro, Mike Poe, my boy out there in Arkansas, Mike Sarno, Mitchell Watson, Mona McCure, Ned Eric, what up, Ned? Ned is a friend of mine that I've seen in five different states. Uh, just because he happened to be working in, in different states when I was there performing. Pretty cool. Nikki Butcher. Nico Fernandino. Nix Balainalta. Old McTronald. Ooh, that's the future right there. Old Scrote McCracken. Owen Lied. Patty J. Passenger Shaming. Thank you, Passenger Shaming. They've been so supportive on Instagram as well. Go follow them. 
Paul Flores, one of the smartest men I know. I met him on semester at sea. A beautiful man, beautiful family. Philip James, Key Jenkins, Ranger Rick, Renee Nicole. Hello, Renee. Ren D, Robin Tatu, Ryan Crafts, Ryan Forrest, Ryan Jordan, Ryan Cranring, Ryan Walsh, Sam Nilgen, Sarah Anderson, Scott Lucy, Scott Swain. Hi, I'm Scott Swain. Scott Swan would be a good name too. Shane Pacheco. Shannon Schulte. Stacey Blessing. Stepfan Jeffries. Oh, that's a dope name. Stepfan? Stepfan Jeffries, dude? Yeah, man. Stephanie Clare. Steve Corlew. That madman. Steven Sung. 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 Cho. Suzanne O'Reilly, that dude with the paper bag, the Asian hamster gang, the shit-faced chef, Tim Greener, Tim Ozilik, Timothy Ironman, Tom in rural North Carolina, Tommy Reddit, Travis Vowell, and sometimes why, Ty Oliver, Tyler Harrington, Tyler Shaver, Victor Montano, William Morris, my boy Bill Morris up there from the Bay. I love you, Bill. And Zach Johnson. Um, those are our Patreoners, man. As always, this episode is brought to you by Gray Block Pizza. 1811 Pico Boulevard, Santa Monica, on the way to the beach. Gray Block Pizza. Get that hitter. Happy Thanksgiving, man. Be good to yourselves, guys. Uh, and thank you for being good to me, man. Thank you very, uh, very, very much. <laughs> Just sitting on your front porch Wondering how could I be so far from my home And my mind is somewhere else But when I find it I'll patch up where it's been blown Now I'm just floating on the breeze And I feel I'm falling like these leaves I must be Happy Thanksgiving, guys. Oh, but when I reach that ground, I'll share this piece of mind I found. I can feel it in my bones. But it's gonna take a little time for me to set that that park and break and let myself all wild.